Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren. I am your host. If you are finding this video on YouTube, please make sure to give us a thumbs up or a like. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you are new. And hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. If you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, or any other podcast platform, please make sure to give us a follow on there as well, so long as that's a thing you can do on your podcast platform of choice. And then also leave us a five-star review, especially you know, Apple Podcasts is really the one where you can leave a five-star review, so please make sure to do that there. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Professor Wren, where I post updates to the show and any other thing about history that I think is interesting that I might want to share with you all, the viewers at home. So in today's lecture, I guess you could say, we are exiting the, the reign of Justinian. We spent a good several episodes there on Justinian. And now it is time to transition away from him. If you are interested in any information about Justinian, we did a whole boatload of lectures on them. Another one of our little mini series here. We did sort of a mini series on the fall of Rome and the age of migration, barbarian invasion, whichever you like to call that time period of history, which was really interesting. You can go back and listen to those episodes. And you can also go back and listen to the episodes where we talked a lot about Justinian. But for right now, we are going to talk about Justinian's successor. So the, the basic outline of this, of this lecture, before I really get into it, we're going to talk about several of the successors of Justinian. It'll be Justin II, uh, it'll be Tiberius, Maurice, and then Focus. And then we'll pick up next time with Heraclius, who is, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, kind of a tragic hero uh, character. Because he, as, I'll, as I'll kind of tease at the end of the episode, but I'll, I might as well mention it here as well, uh, Heraclius has some real heroic feats, but at the same time is, is kind of a tragic uh, character, which we'll certainly get into in depth when we talk about Heraclius. But for now, we will talk about Justin the second. So the successor to Justinian, his nephew, that is Justin the second, he ascends the throne in 565. Now he was involved in the imperial court of Justinian. However, it seems that Justinian did not really trust him a great deal because he gave him limited responsibilities. He was not, you know, his right hand man at court, for example, um, was was sort of, you know, kind of tucked away. Like, yeah, you know, he's my little my little nephew here, who his his mom, my auntie, wanted me to bring along, but you know. We, we aren't really going to give him anything, any major responsibilities. And you may be asking, why is it that Justinian, why, why did a son of Justinian not follow him to the throne? And the answer to that is that Justinian had uh, no children. Which may bring up a whole you know, series of questions about Justinian and his personal life, but you know, understand that uh, Justinian, we, we know Justinian was exclusive with his wife, Theodora. You know, it, it's quite possible that there were simply you know, fertility issues between I, either one of them. Um, and because Justinian did not have a harem of women, which he, you know, picked from at will, like many other emperors do, uh, if there is a there is a fertility issue with Theodora there, uh, there's no one else <laughs> he's got around to provide him an heir. Uh, and he wasn't like Henry VIII, just beheading his wives uh, <laughs> until one of them can, can give him a successor. Now, uh, Justin's reign was certainly marked by neuroticism. It's clear that uh, uh, Justin had what we would call today uh, some real mental health issues. Uh, to start off with, he became very obsessed with saving money. Uh, quite the opposite from his uncle, because we know Justinian really loved, really was into <laughs> spending money between his wars of expansion, his building projects, as well. The Corpus Chivalis was 
you know, certainly not free. You have to pay scholars to, to work on that and all and, and whatnot. <clears throat> uh, but by the time, you know, by the time Justinian uh, uh, goes to his eternal resting place, uh, it had, you know, that spending has put a real strain on the treasury, which in he was in a fortunate situation uh, because of his predecessor Anastasius, who left him a, a very uh, a fat cash cow to be working with. Now, also at the time of Justin II's ascent to the throne, you have the uh, the Avars, who are another one of these Central Asian nomadic groups similar to the Huns. The, the Avars are, uh, we know more about the Avars than the Huns. I, I'm almost certain that Avars are a Turkic people. Uh, but they start pushing westward along the Danube River out of the Romans' hair at the moment. They're on, you know, they're on the north side of the Danube. But this also causes another Germanic group called the Lombards to move west as well. And the Lombards end up moving west into Italy. This is going to cause the Byzantines to lose a, a significant portion of their Italian holdings. Now, Justin as well inexplicably relieved the Armenian general Narsus, who you'll remember uh, from our our episode uh, on uh, the, the the Gothic Wars. He comes in at the tail ends of, uh, of the Gothic Wars because Belisarius is off in the east and there are some perhaps trust issues between Belisarius and Justinian in the later years. Uh, but Narsus was a highly competent commander who really finished off the Ostrogoths. And for uh, some reason, there, do, there no one seems to really know why uh, Justin relieved Narsus of his command in Italy, and without a strong commander there, the Byzantines lost much of the territory that they fought so hard for. You'll remember when we talked about Belisarius's initial con uh, uh, campaigns in Italy, we said that after he left the first time, the commanders there uh, resorted to a lot of infighting and squabbling, which left them open to a resurgence from the Ostrogoths. And it seems that after Narsus leaves Italy as well, basically this, a very similar thing happens. I don't, know, I don't know what it was about the commanders there in Italy, but they were certainly prone to uh, getting in their own way. Byzantines also saw issues with attacks in North Africa by the Moors and by the Visigoths in Spain, which Justin does not address. He does not want to spend money, even though uh, in Treadgold, and, and I'll, 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 I'll just mention this now, mo most of this episode I am, I am uh, using Warren Treadgold's uh, Concise History of Byzantium. I've mentioned it before on the show. I'll leave a link in the description to the Amazon page where you can buy it, it's it's pretty cheap. The nice thing the nice thing about studying history is most of your sourcing, most of your books are pretty cheap. I remember, <laughs> I remember in college, uh, as a history major, you know, oftentimes spending less than two hundred dollars a semester on books, whereas my my classmates and friends who were who were science majors, good lord, some of them, you know, sometimes spending seven hundred dollars on books. So. Uh, I certainly didn't envy them in that regard. And as I said, uh, Justin uh, could have spent a relatively small amount of money. And again, this is, this is essentially what Treadgold says uh, to, to send small amounts of soldiers to North Africa and to Spain to kind of settle the situation there. And he just doesn't because he's, he's, He's become obsessive with, with saving money at this point. However, Justin was cons very concerned with the situation in the East. And obviously here we're again talking about the Persians, which is odd because the Eastern Romans and the Persians are in a state of peace right now. And Justinian, you remember Justinian uh, worked very meticulously to secure a, a peace deal with the Persians in the East. However, 
Justin decided to break that peace deal. And as a result, the Persians sieged the frontier city of Dara and took it. Now, Dara had been the anchor of the Byzantine defenses in the east for quite some time, ever since the reign of Anastasius, who was emperor before Justinian. And this mistake would have consequences for some time to come because really, uh, to kind of give you a little preview of what's gonna happen here, the next several emperors are all going to have issues with wars with the Persians. And one could make the argument that if Justin had just maintained uh, the, peace, the peaceful status with the Persians, which his uncle had set up for him, um, those, those, the, the years of wars between Persia and the Byzantines, I mean, it's, it's entirely possible that peace would have broken down at some point, but there was no, there was no need to. Um, th there was no reason why uh, Justin broke this peace treaty. It's, it's not like, you know, the Persians were threatening uh, to attack and he just wanted to have the upper hand. Uh, but this issue, especially of losing Dara, is going to become a big pain for the Byzantines because they're going to have a lot of trouble getting it back. Now, when Dara fell, Justin realized that he made a serious mistake and is at this point that, like I said, I think he, not, not to be an armchair psychologist, but one has to wonder if he had some underlying mental health issues already at this point in his life and that the stress of the situation and realizing what a serious mistake he made in starting this war with the Persians really compounded the mental health problems that he that already existed um, to the point where he attempted to, to take his own life. Uh, and it was at that point that his wife, Sophia, basically puts him under regency and, and really uh, uh, removes him from any sort of real authority in the empire. And they put him under the regency of a friend of his, uh, who was the Count of the Exubitores named Tiberius. And again, uh, for those of you who may not remember, I've, I've mentioned the Exubitores before here, but the Exubitores are, a, they're an elite, uh, uh, like Imperial Guard type unit in the Byzantine military. So the guy who's the head of that is going to be you know, pretty, pretty highly competent, one of, your, one of your better military leaders, and that guy is Tiberius. So Tiberius, Tiberius II, uh, there's a, another Roman emperor named Tiberius back in the Julio-Claudian dynasty. That was all the cats can nap. Uh, that was how my high school Latin teacher taught us to remember the Julio-Claudian dynasty. That was uh, all the, so Augustus, uh, I'm forgetting one of the T's here. Now I have to Google it. Augustus, Tiberius, uh, oh no, all the, no, there's only one T, duh. Remember the acronym, right? Augustus, Caligula, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Good job, professor. Way to, way to bring up a, a reference here and forget what it is. Uh, but yes, Mrs. Good old Mrs. D'Angelo uh, taught us that in Latin. Julio, Claudia, all the cats can nap. It's an acronym. Augustus Caligula, or sorry, Augustus Tiberius Caligula Claudius Nero. Anyway, so Tiberius is another uh, Thracian man. You'll notice here in this in this time period that we're talking about. I believe all but one of the emperors are going to be uh, some sort of from some sort of Thracian background. You know, Justinian was uh, had a Thracian background. Uh, Belisarius as well uh, came from. Thrace, Justin, uh, Justin the second was, and, and uh, uh, Justinian's uncle Justin, who brought him into the imperial court, also of a Thracian background. And the next couple, uh, a couple of the next guys here, or at least one of the next guys here, we'll we'll talk about also was from Thrace. Uh, however, unlike Justinian, 
uh, Tiberius's mother tongue seems to have been Greek, and as and and as as we said, uh, Justinian was the last Roman emperor whose first language was Latin. Everyone after him, their first language is Greek. Until we get to the point where, and, and, and although at this point, uh, Latin is still the official administrative language of the Eastern Roman Empire, and I. It's escaping me which emperor makes it, officially makes the switch to Greek. Um, but I believe at this time, Latin is still the, the, the language of government, the administrative language in the empire. Now, Tiberius came into prominence in his war against the Avars. Now, what happened here was that Justin the second stopped paying subsidies or tribute to the Avars, which Justinian had arranged. Uh, you all know my, my stance on paying tribute to barbarians. Uh, if you were listening back when we did our Barbarian Invasion series, or mini-series, but I'll just reiterate it for people who weren't around for that. Uh, I think it's a big waste of time and money because you, you, you know, the Romans are sending these, these piles and piles of gold and, and whatever uh, uh, nice stuff, silver uh, trinkets, they send all these stuff, all these things to barbarians. And what a, what inevitably ends up happening? The barbarians attack anyway. So you might as well just not pay them the subsidies, keep the money for yourself, and use it to fight the war against them, which you're going to inevitably fight anyway. So that would be a point of a point of difference that I would have with Justinian. But you know, I'm not a Roman emperor, so. <laughs> uh, if I was a, if I was at court with Justinian, you know, he was he was known as being very strong-willed, but I I certainly would have been very vocal about my my disagreements with him on this. But anyway, so negotiations broke down. So after the after Justin decides to stop paying tribute to the Avars, he does try to negotiate. There there's some uh, there's uh, something about a hostage exchange. Justin wanted the children of the. Uh, Avar's Khan to be to be the hostages. They did not agree to that. The negotiations broke down, and and war breaks out. And so Justin sends Tiberius to go deal with the issue, which he did. And this brought him into uh, you know Justin's good graces. They became uh, they apparently became friends. Um, and just uh, Tiberius, sir, they they gave him the title of Caesar, which but in in more practical terms, uh, he was really ruling as Justin's regent from uh, beginning in 574 until Justin took his own life in 578. So he earlier, um, you know, as we said, unfortunately, he attempted to take his own life. And then in 578, he, he ended up taking his own life. So uh, a very tragic ending for him indeed. Now, Tiberius, as a career military man, wanted to bring the wars with the Persians to a swift end. Now in doing so, he spent much of the money, he's, uh, he, yeah, he spent much of the money which Justin had saved up before him. We mentioned that he was kind of a neurotic saver. What he, now what Tiberius does is he buys himself a four year truce to make preparations for a surge against the Persians. And when war broke out, he chooses as the general to lead uh, the fight there, a guy named Maurice. We'll talk about more here in a minute. And Maurice won a number of impressive victories against the Persians. However, the Persians hold out. Even though they've been defeated a number of times, they're not willing to come to the negotiating table. They're not willing to talk about a peace treaty. And, you know, you can't necessarily blame them because they had just been in a, a pretty agreeable state of peace before and the Byzantines completely blew it up. So who's to say that, you know, that's not going to happen again. And you know, why would you trust these people after they just did this? I, I kind of understand it from the Persian perspective. Tiberius, even actually, he, he offers to trade the lands which were taken by Maurice. Uh, I believe most of those were in Armenia in exchange for Dara. Uh, because that was really the goal, right? The goal of the, the Byzantines at this point in time is to get the city of Dara back so that they can have that, have that defensive anchor against the Persians in the east. However, the Persians don't budge. Uh, they, won't, they won't come to the negotiating table. 
Now, unfortunately for the Byzantines, Tiberius falls seriously ill before any serious progress can be made during this campaign. Maurice was out on campaign, but however, he was recalled to Constantinople as the emperor was dying. And before Tiberius dies, he has Maurice marry his daughter, and which basically sets him up to be, you know, to be the next emperor. And not too long after that, Tiberius dies and Maurice ascends to the imperial throne in 578. Now, Maurice has kind of, he, he really has a mixed bag. He, there are some things where I really like him, and then there are some things, what, uh, is one thing really in particular, well, I guess you could say two things, where he's really boneheaded, where he's really just uh, like, y you look at him and it's like, wh why? That's, a, that's an awful, like making awful decisions, uh, not learning from his past mistakes, um, uh, Maurice is really, uh, he's a mixed bag, I have to say. He, he does, he does have a fairly long reign. Uh, he, he comes in here, uh, in about half down here, 582, but Tiberius does die in 580 or five, sorry, 578. So I, I believe I have a bit of a typo here. <laughs> Uh, but he's on the throne until 602. But so either way, he's got he's got about a 12 to 15 year reign here. Uh, he was born so he here we have an exception to uh, our trend here of Thracian emperors. He uh, Maurice was born in Cappadocia. And he does realize that the empire is in a pickle. Obviously, he's been he's the he's the lead general out there against the Persians in the east, and he there are, the Byzantines are also dealing with in the west. The Avars and the Slavs are raiding into the Balkans and Greece, still as well. So he's dealing with it on opposite ends of the empire. And at one point in time, he does try to move because really, as as we've been talking about here, a lot of times the emperors we have, they're, they're trying to concentrate all of their resources in the East in their wars against the Persians, really neglecting things that are going on in the West, either in the newly acquired uh, or newly reconquered provinces in the West or in the Balkans. Now, we do need to keep in mind that of all the areas in the Eastern Roman Empire, the Balkans are really not they're not a major area. They're not a major population center. They're not a major center of wealth. Um, even though Constantinople is in, is in Europe, um, it's, it's incredibly well protected. You know, no one really has a fighter's chance of, of breaking into that city at this point in time. You know, it's not going to be until, until gunpowder is invented that, that anyone's got a real shot at getting in there. Um, and, and, you know, Syria and Egypt, and uh, uh, coastal Anatolia, that's really where the money is being made. That's where the population centers are. So the things that are going on in the Balkans, they're not necessarily top priority, but still you obviously don't wanna have these raids going on. However, so Maurice does kind of break with, break uh, the trend from previous emperors and he sends forces, uh, reinforcements really I should say, to the Balkans to help deal or to try to help deal with the Slavs and the Avars. However, uh, they don't really help. They, they, he sends in reinforcements and they're still, they're, they're not making any progress uh, against the Slavs and the Avars, they're, they're, they're losing. Now, in a foolhardy attempt, now this is, this is where I really sour on, on Maurice. Uh, in a foolhardy attempt to save money in these costly wars, Maurice declared that the soldiers equipment would be supplied by the state and that their, their allowance to buy their own arms, which was instituted back by Anastasius, would be ended. Now, to just kind of re refresh everyone's memory, or if you weren't listening back when we talked about Anastasius, the Emperor Anastasius came up with this policy whereby the Byzantine Empire would not 
pr directly provide soldiers with like standard issued weapons and armor. What they would do is they would provide soldiers with a stipend uh, to buy their own weapons and armor and supplies and that sort of thing. And if they had any money left over, uh, they could keep it. And this was a pretty, apparently a pretty good deal for the soldiers because I mean, you see, they, they, they got very upset about this. Um, so obviously this was a significant source of income for them. And just, I mean, obviously, generally speaking, you, you don't want to mess around with soldiers pay. Um, you know, I was critical in our Justinian episodes when he, when we talked about how he wouldn't, he, he wasn't paying, uh, the soldiers in, in like Italy, for example, due to you know, financial constraints, but still, I mean, not paying soldiers or, or cutting soldiers pay is, is never a good idea. You get disgruntled soldiers. And in this case, in this case, you actually get a full on mutiny. So, so this, and, and, in the East as well. I mean, this is, and, and as I said, in, in Syria, what we're talking about here, which is one of the more, the more important areas of the empire because Antioch is a huge city. It's a patriarchal sea, big population center. Lots of trade goes on in Syria and Antioch specifically. So you end up with rogue armies raiding through Syria, giving, which give the Persians a perfect opportunity to, to make headway. They take some Byzantine territory in Eastern Syria and as well, they also, uh, the, their, the general rating and that sort of thing, causing all sorts of problems. Now, fortunately for Maurice, the leader uh, who was elected for this rebellion was loyal to the empire. And he managed, he gets, he rallies the soldiers to beat back the Persians, though, though not all of the territory that the Persians take there is regained. But order is restored, the mutiny is kind of quelled, um, Maurice basically backs off this policy of, um, uh, of removing the soldier's stipend to, to buy their own equipment and then keeping whatever was left over and, and things are looking all right for now. Now, an, inter uh, uh, an interesting thing comes up here for Maurice and the Byzantines. So. The Byzantines do come up, do happen upon some luck here on the Persian front, and that is Persian rebellions. Now, at this point in time, the Persian wars have been going on for about 18 years. And just as the Byzantines are growing tired of the war, so are the Persians. If you think about it, even today, for example, you know, the United States, uh, uh, Joe Biden is talking a lot about pulling all the troops out of Afghanistan. And the United States war in Afghanistan has been going on for like, 20 years. And, and many people have, you know, in the United States, I'll speak only for the United States because that's where I live. I don't know if you know, there's a similar sentiment in Australia or the UK or anywhere else in Europe. Um, but people in the United States have, for the most part, grown tired of the war. And so the Persians in this situation, the first thing they do is they ran their emperor or king or whatever you want to call him. I think, I think it's probably more fitting to call him an emperor. It's, it is, even though it's not the Persian empire of old, it's still, it's still an empire, I would say. Uh, but they replaced their old king with his son, whose name I'm going to try my best to pronounce this. I'm not familiar with uh, Persian or Farsi or what have you. Uh, but his name was Kus Kusrao. Uh, <clears throat> however, soon after they put Kusrao on the throne, they run him out of town as well and replace him with a general named Bahram. Now, Kusrao fled Persia to Byzantine territory and uh, uh, asked Maurice for help to get himself back on the throne. And what he says to Maurice is, if you help me get back on the throne, I, as Persian emperor, will give you back Dara, give you the city of Martyropolis, which was one of the cities taken uh, when the Persians broke through during that uh, mutiny I mentioned earlier, and then as well most of Armenia. A lot because a lot a lot of the, the the fighting that's been going on at this point in time has been over Armenia, which 
uh, sometimes was controlled by the Byzantines and sometimes was controlled by the Persians. Although I, I would say Armenia, prob the people in Armenia probably lean more Byzantine than Persian because Armenia was a Christian kingdom, uh, remains predominantly Christian today. And uh, Khosrau also all offers the Byzantines uh, the protectorate over Iberia, which was an area uh, the kind of on the black, I believe, I believe today, uh, it's essentially what is now Georgia, although I could be wrong about that. Now, Bahram offered Maurice, Dara, Martyropolis, and Nisbis. Nisbis was a city uh, which would today be in, I, I believe, northern Iraq or eastern Syria. Um, but but Bahram offered Maurice those three cities if he would just not interfere and let Bahram take care of Khosrau himself. And it seems that uh, Maurice believed that Khosrau's offer was one that he simply could not refuse to make a little God, Godfather reference there. And this will not be the only Godfather reference I make today. Uh, Godfather is just, it's, it's probably my favorite movie. I was watching earlier today, I was watching uh, the baptism scene from The Godfather. And it's just, it's, it's one of the greatest scenes in film. It might be the best scene in all of film. But so Narciss, uh, oh, sorry, not Narciss. I'm going to talk about him here in a second. Maurice's choice uh, ends up working out fairly well. He sends, a lar he sends Narciss at the head of a large army to help uh, Khosrau get back onto the Persian throne. <clears throat> uh, Narciss and his army take back a number of cities, which were lost to the Persians um, along the way. They crush Bahram and reinstate Khosrau on the Persian throne. So now they have a friendly uh, uh, monarch over there in Persia. Uh, the war is essentially over. Um, they get back the cities that they wanted to get back. Uh, Khosrau does, does he stays true to his word. He gives back Dara, Martiopolis, and a lot of Armenia and Iberia. Now, Maurice's next item on his to-do list was to finish the war with the Slavs. Now, this is, a, we just had good Maurice. Now we're about to have another bad Maurice situation. Now, in order to save money here, and he's all, you know, he's always looking to cut corners with, with the military. This is, this is kind of my, my, my bugaboo with him or whatever you want to call it. But in order to try to save some money during this camp, during this campaign against the Slavs, what he does is instead of fighting the Slavs in Byzantine territory, he sends the army north of the Danube to attack the Slavs in their homeland because understand these are just these are raids now are some of some of the Slavs are settling in Byzantine territory but there's still a lot of them who are raiding in Byzantine territory and going back again back across the Danube River and living there like permanently and so what Maurice is trying to do is he's trying to attack them on their home territory to get them out of Byzantine territory which is not a terrible idea however the issue is going to become that Maurice also orders the army to make winter quarters north of the Danube and to live off the land so he and the Byzantine Empire do not have to pay to support them during that winter. Now, this is obviously unpopular. Uh, scavenging and, and li armies living off the land is not, not exactly easy. Um, you know, sometimes there's food, sometimes there isn't, sometimes people are not, you know, not willing to give a foreign army uh, their food. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very less than desirable situation. Uh, that, that, I mean, living off the land is what caused Hannibal's campaign to, to derail um, in, Italy, in Italy. Now, at the same time, Maurice also very, very stupidly, again, ends the allowance uh, for soldiers to buy their weapons and armor. And the soldiers threatened to mutiny again. And when the commander of the army, which was north of the Danube, um, promised to pay the difference in income for the soldiers out of his own pocket, 
Maurice dismissed him from his command and I replaced him, I think, with a guy named Priscus. Um, but this is really, I, like, I, 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 why? Why would you do that? Like, this guy is offering to pay out of his own pocket. It's not coming out of the imperial treasury. Like, what difference does it make to you? Like, the soldiers are going to be happier anyway because they're being paid, you know, the same amount. They're not having to take a pay cut. And, and you just get rid of this guy. You know, not, not only is that, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's not making you more popular with the soldiers. And you're relieving a, a general who clearly has the best interest of his soldiers at heart, um, which is only going to put you in a worse situation with the military. Now, fortunately, fortunately for Maurice, the soldiers, although they do threaten to mutiny, don't mutiny this time. Um, instead, they do fight valiantly. They defeat both the Slavic and the Avar foes, uh, kind of relieving them of raids for the time being. However, again, Maurice uh, orders the army to take winter quarters north of the Danube. That This is a second time. And maybe they, maybe they would have put up with it. However, there was an extraordinarily bad winter, very bad conditions, and this brought the men to revolt. Now, apparently, and this, according, this again, according to Treadgold, uh, Maurice's brother, whose name was Peter, was in command of, this, of the army here in question, north of the Danube. And he considered... Um, considered ignoring this order and basically saying like not not paying attention to what Murray said and bringing the army back into friendly territory for the winter uh, especially with the with the harsh winter conditions however he understood that if he were to do this he just would have been dismissed with his he would have been dismissed from his command replaced and they would have had to do, had to do it anyway and so after that happens uh, the army uh, basically promotes a subordinate officer whose name was Focus. He was like a junior general, uh, I guess you could say. And they, this, they're in full revolt. They, they put Focus as, the, as their new leader, and they march on Constantinople. So Focus and his rebel army, again, marching towards Constantinople. And Maurice realizes at this point that he has lost any support. The military does no longer supports him. And when you're a Byzantine emperor, when you're a Roman emperor, or really any ancient or medieval uh, uh, leader, king, prince, uh, if you don't have support of a military, then you, are really, you really have no power at all. And so Maurice attempts to flee the city. However, he was captured by the rebels and executed along with his brothers and five of his sons. However, one son does escape, which will, or supposedly escapes, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but this is also, the, I, I find this a very Michael Corleone style where, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in the baptism scene, he takes out the heads of the five families, eliminating any uh, uh, threats to his power the same way here. Focus is taking out not just Maurice, but his, all of the men in his family to eliminate threats to his power. Now, Focus is another Thracian here. He's born in uh, 574, or sorry, 547. Excuse me. Uh, and he reign, He has a shorter reign. Uh, he's he's only in power from 602 until 610. And not much is known about his life before uh, his usurpation, other than he was a career soldier. Sorry if that sound was unpleasant. And now the real issue for Focus is that his reign was as a usurper. He, he was, you know, an illegitimate uh, uh, emperor. He, he, had no, he had no legal claim to the throne. He also had no real, seems like he probably was not very well educated, uh, didn't have a lot of experience with governing, uh, didn't have a lot of knowledge of the law. And you know, although he was a good soldier, clearly had the respect of the men who served under him, that's not the only thing that makes you a good, a good leader, especially a leader of a whole empire. And many of the, uh, uh, of the people who are in the imperial court from the previous uh, Emperor Maurice, the holdovers in the imperial court, either did not recognize him as emperor because again, he had no legal claim 
to the throne. He was a usurper, or they feared that they would have him, or that that uh, focus would deal with them the same way that he dealt with Maurice and his family. They were all afraid that he would that he would kill them, and he did uh, kill. I believe it was. Um, Maurice's uh, wife or daughter and his old like father-in-law or something. They, they attempted to conspire against him and he had them. Initially, he had them uh, tonsured to uh, monasteries um, and then they attempted to conspire against him a second time, which after which he had them executed, which, which that, I mean, that's reasonable. Um, you know, kind of, kind of the fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on, shame on me kind of thing. Uh, these palace intrigues often they have to be dealt with um, pretty seriously. Now here here's the here's the interesting part about uh, uh, focus and his reign here. Now, I mentioned earlier that supposedly one of the members of Maurice's family escapes. It's a guy named Tiberius. I believe this is his youngest son. Um, and the story goes that Tiberius fled to the court of Khusrau, the Persian emperor who his father helped restore to the throne in Persia. And he sought his aid basically to get himself, again, Tiberius, back on the throne the same way that Khusrau helped uh, or the same way that Khusra was helped by Maurice get back on the Persian throne. So kind of, you know, we scratched your back, now it's time for you to scratch our back. And both Khusra and Narsus, remember the old Byzantine Armenian general, marched in opposition to Phocas. Uh, neither of them recognized Phocas as a legitimate emperor, and so they both uh, uh, were in opposition to him. Now, the plot does twist here because Focus claims that he ha had found Tiberius and killed him later on, separately from when he killed the rest of um, uh, Maurice's family. However, Narcissus and Kusrau both claim that, they, that uh, Tiberius was under their protection, in some, I mean, essentially in some sort of witness protection program. So you have, on one hand, Focus saying that he's dead, and on the other hand, you've got Narcissus and Kusrau saying, no, he's still alive. We know where he is. We're hiding him and protecting him. Uh, it definitely gives off kind of a Romanov vibe, right? The one family, uh, the one, the one uh, family member who has escaped and is sort of living in protected obscurity. You know, are they alive? Are they not alive? Definitely has a very Anastasia Romanov uh, type vibe. Although I, I, I don't subscribe to the idea that Anastasia Romanov survived the massacre of the Romanovs, but you know, that some people had, you know, for years theorized that she had survived. And there was that, that one woman, I think in France who claimed that she was, that she was Anastasia Romanoff. It, it's really, it's just, it's just not possible because like how, how does anyone escape from a basement massacre in, in the middle of the frozen uh, uh, Russian wilderness? Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. But it, it's, yeah. It's a similar type story is the point I'm trying to make. Now, during all of this chaos that's going on with, is Tiberius alive, is he not alive? Narsus is a Byzantine ge uh, general who's trying to fight back against the Byzantine usurper and we're getting the Persian emperor involved to try to get the uh, uh, deposed uh, uh, Byzantine prince back on the throne and all of this. The exarch of uh, Africa sends forces to claim the imperial title for his family. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I haven't brought it up yet on the program, but the exarch is, or an exarch is leader, is a leader of an exarchate. And an exarchate was a military and civil administrative region, which the Byzantines created that had a good deal of autonomy. The, the Byzantines set this up like in, uh, there's an exarch in Africa, uh, Italy, I think there was one in Syria, or not, I'm sorry, not Syria. Um, I believe there was one in Sicily at one point in time, uh, in Spain as well. This is basically a way to kind of uh, relieve some of the pressure on the Byzantine state of governing all of these areas. And they, they were 
I mean, almost independent, basically uh, an exarch was kind of like a governor who had, I, I, if I'm remembering this correctly, both civil and military authority and in, in his particular area. And he basically was tasked with, with governing it. And, and the only, uh, uh, they really just old, they, you know, still were part of the Byzantine empire, paid taxes to the Byzantine empire, old, old, old loyalty to the emperor and all of that. But apart from that, the emperor himself is not really dealing with any, any sort of governance in these, in these exarchates. But like I said, the exarch of Africa starts sending uh, military forces into this whole uh, uh, big mess to try to get him and his family on the imperial throne. So this exarch of Africa was a guy named uh, Heraclius. And so first he sends his nephew uh, Niketus overland, so from North Africa across Libya to Egypt with an army where he fights Phocus and defeats him. Uh, and then later on, he sends his son Heraclius, so this would be like Her Heraclius the Younger. Uh, he sends his son with the navy to Constantinople to complete their, their overthrow, so to speak. And so in 610, uh, Heraclius the Younger does enter Constantinople. He has Phocus executed and proclaims himself emperor, and he, he does indeed become emperor. Um, and it, I can understand maybe if you have the question, like, well, how is this guy a usurper? And, or how, how would Heraclius not be a usurper, but... Um, but Focus was, it would and the answer to that really is that Focus was kind of, you know, a lower level, like I said, junior officer, uh, whereas Heraclius comes from a family that's already in power in the Byzantine Empire, and so it's not a, it's not a stretch to, to extend the recognition from Exarch of Africa to, um, to, to the emperor. And now, like I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, Heraclius is going to show a great deal of courage. He's going, he, uh, I, I find him pretty impressive, but at the same time, he's also fairly tragic. Um, essentially what's going to happen is there's going to be a massive Persian invasion. Uh, much of uh, Byzantine territory is going to be lost. Heraclius is going to make a big comeback, win a lot of it back. But at that point in time, things are fractured to the point where it, it's, it's like the Fisher in the house of Usher, you know, it's only a matter of time until that thing comes down. Um, and it's gonna happen sooner rather than later. But that's where we're gonna wrap up this week's lecture. I hope you all enjoyed. I do apologize for not doing uh, midweek videos. You know, sometimes you're just not feeling quite as creative. I had some traveling to do on Sunday and Monday, which kind of uh, got in the way of uh, some of the time that I usually use to plan uh, uh, midweek episodes. Uh, but so hopefully, hopefully this week I'll be able to put out at least one, um, kind of get back in the groove of that. If you've made it this far in the video, please make sure to give us a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, please make sure to give us a follow there, and especially on Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star review. We are on Instagram and Facebook. You can check us out at Professor Wren, where I post updates to the show and any other interesting things about history that I want to share with you guys. And so that's it for this time, and I'll see you all on the next one.